Gigantopithecus blackie is the largest primate to ever walk the earth. This species was really massive. Estimations are about three meters tall, probably weighed between about 200 and 300 kilograms. So pretty hefty. <laughs> I think it's really the definition of enigmatic because it's so mysterious. There's so many things we don't know about it. And it's that thing where you have a couple of pieces of the jigsaw, but most of the jigsaw is missing. This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. Today on the show, we're exploring the fascinating story of Gigantopithecus, the most massive primate that ever lived. And we're talking with Dr. Kira Westaway. She's a Leaky Foundation grantee and geochronologist from Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. She's part of an international team of scientists working to piece together the story of the greatest of all great apes. Gigantopithecus stood nearly 10 feet tall, twice the size of a gorilla. It weighed around 600 pounds, so about as heavy as a grizzly bear, and it roamed the forests of prehistoric China for millions of years before vanishing from the face of the earth leaving only small clues and a humongous mystery. How did it live? How was it related to us? And why did it disappear? If you talk to most paleontologists, they'll say it's the golden chalice of paleontology. You know, it's the thing that really excites people about paleontology. We know that it existed and we know it existed because of the fossils that we find. And the only fossils we have in the last 85 years that they've been looking, are four mandibles or four sections of a mandible and 2,000 teeth, something like that. So absolutely no postcranial remains at all. No postcranial remains, no bones from below the head. So that's all we know. And that's why it's so mysterious, because we really only know it like from its teeth. As a geochronologist, Kira's a world-class expert at putting dates to fossils. I realized that quite early on in my career, that if I became somebody that did dating, then I was always going to have a job. <laughs> so I thought it's a really good way of, of, of still being part of archaeology, being part of paleontology, but being able to address the, the timing aspect. The timing aspect is particularly important in the case of Gigantopithecus because of the question around when and why it disappeared. It's an extinction story that we, we just really don't understand. And I think at the time when we started the, the Giganto project in 2015, we were the only people actively working on Gigantopithecus. And it's, it's a really exciting, interesting story. In 1935, anthropologist Ralph von Koningswald was browsing looking for fossils at a market in Hong Kong when he noticed several strange teeth being sold as dragon teeth. He could see that the teeth were ape-like, but they were huge, much bigger than any molar from any known primate species, alive or dead. And back at that time in China and in other parts of Southeast Asia, many kinds of fossils were sold for medicine as dragon bones or dragon teeth. Von Koenigswald was one of the first Western scientists to figure out that because of this, traditional Chinese medicine shops were great places to hunt for fossils. He found and studied a lot of different kinds of fossil teeth that way. And he could see that this one was different. He analyzed the teeth and he and his colleagues tried to figure out what kind of primate did this gigantic tooth belong to? They knew it was a primate, but they couldn't really place it. So there was this long controversy about whether it was an ape or human. And then after a while, they decided that it was actually an ape. And it was von Koniswold that named it Gigantopithecus blackie. And after that, then everyone kind of had an idea of what they were looking for. So they would keep scouring these shops looking for these dragon bones and teeth. And then they started looking for them actually in the landscape. During the 1960s, Chinese scientists from the Institute for Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology started exploring for Gigantopithecus fossils. And they started excavating around in, in southern China. And they, they were the first to find in situ giganto teeth in a cave called Dashin, which we actually visited when we went back there. And that was the first time that they actually found bones in the sediment so we could get a context for the age and where they came from. 
So in all the years between 1935, when von Koenigswald first found that huge tooth, and today, scientists have searched across China, and they found a few thousand teeth, a few very, very large fragments of jawbones, but no trace, no remains at all from the body of this giant creature. And you'd think, given its size, its bones would stand out a bit. My colleague, Ying Chi Zhang from IVPP, he's been excavating there at least 20 years. And in that 20 years, we've probably found hundreds of caves. And all of them, majority of them are teeth. Like, that's what we get. Is we find teeth of, of, of mammals, not just of Giganto, obviously, of other mammals as well. And humans sometimes as well. But never, never bones. So we've probably found about three caves that actually have bones inside. So it's very, very rare to find bones uh, in a cave. Bones tend to break down in places where it's hot and wet. Tooth enamel is preserved for much longer, and the preservation is better than bony body parts. Unfortunately, teeth can tell us a lot. So people always go, oh, you only found teeth. That's not very useful, is it? And I'm like, well, actually, if I was going to find a teeth or a bone, I think I'd rather find a tooth. They, they store up so much information about the animal and how it was living. So obviously you can do stable isotopes on the teeth to understand how much water it was drinking, what type of food it was eating, so that can help you reconstruct the environment. Trace elements also tell you about the mobility, how much they were moving around in the landscape. Did they have a big range or were they quite um, restricted in the range in which they moved around, which I think is amazing. But that is a real indication of how well the population is doing. So much information you can get, even things like lines of stress. Like, so maybe the animal had I don't know, broken its arm at some point, so it went through this really stressful period. And you can see those lines of stress within the teeth. And because scientists know that Gigantopithecus was around for a long time, changes in the teeth can show how the animal evolved. So the teeth are large. They're, they're large molars, even for the, the fact that, you know, the, the, the species is large. They are actually very large molars. The enamel is quite sort of puffy looking um very very thick enamel compared to other species um other mammals uh, other primates as well and we see some really interesting evolution so the giganto tooth actually its teeth actually got bigger over time rather than smaller so they actually got bigger so we find that the younger the, the latest the youngest teeth um, around 300,000 are much much larger than the much earlier teeth a 2019 study of giganto tooth enamel has told us that Gigantopithecus was closely related to modern orangutans, and they shared a common ancestor between 10 and 12 million years ago. Microscopic bits of fossilized plants in the teeth revealed more about what these apes were chomping on. Those fossil particles combined with data from isotopes and the shape and structure of the teeth, as well as the deep, strong jaws, all tell a story of a vegetarian giant that lived in the forest and ate a specialized diet of fibrous plants like bamboo, as well as seeds and fruit. So you can imagine a 10-foot-tall ape, similar to an orangutan, but much too big to climb in the trees. It's a very strange side branch of our primate family tree. And you might be thinking, giant, upright, walking ape? Um, That's Bigfoot. Every time I talk about Giganto, everyone says, oh, yes, yeah, I, there was that sighting and there was this. And it, it's very much part of popular culture. Every culture has its own version of the walking upright ape. You've got the Sasquatch up in Canada. And then, you know, Himalaya's got the Yeti. And then Bigfoot, you guys have got, obviously. And, and I think that when we do come out with a paper on Giganto, we're going to get a lot of people emailing us. Somebody told me that there was a sighting of a large upright walking ape but they, it was in New South Wales, in Sydney. I was just like, mm, no. And, you know, when they did find a Gigantopithecus in the fossil record, I think everyone was like, well, you see there, there's the proof. There's the proof that Yeti, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, you know, that he, he's alive, it's alive. In all seriousness, Kira says there's really two big questions about Gigantopithecus right now. One is, what did it look like? Because we need to find postcranial material. That's the thing. Once we find the postcranial, then we can really get a better understanding of, of really how big they were, because obviously we're scaling up from teeth or mandibles, which is very difficult. And the other big question is obviously, why did they go extinct? And, and, and with such a massive primate, it obviously 
understanding why very, very large fauna, like what we call megafauna, when extinct is really important for the, the fate of our current very large animals like elephants and giraffes and things like that. So what happened to Giganto can have implications for our future extinctions of the animals that we know right now. Gigantopithecus is the only non-human ape that we know has gone extinct in the past 2.6 million years. Orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and of course humans have all survived. And now Kira's team is trying to answer, why didn't Gigantopithecus make it? When we first started looking at the extinction of Giganto, there was probably about eight Giganto caves that we knew of in southern China in two places, one in Chongzua down south and then one just to the north a little bit in a place called Bubing Basin. So those are the the two places where we find the youngest Giganto material. And we're starting to do a program of dating these sites to try and understand exactly when Giganto drops out the fossil record. And it's what I call the extinction window. When, When is that point where you know, spatially over a wider area, we just see Giganto no more and it's taken over by other fauna. To understand why Giganto disappeared, you need to know when it disappeared. And as a geochronologist, identifying when is Kira's specialty. So uh, geochronology is just dating, trying to work out when events happen. And what I love about dating is it applies to everything, like any any sort of science that involves sediments or, or fossils or anything like that always needs to know when something happened. And timing becomes so important for like the first arrival of, of hominins in, in a continent or the first time a stone tool was made or the first rock art or even was this hominin here at the same time as this one? Did they overlap? Did they interact? And that's all to do with timing. Kira specializes in a dating technique called luminescent dating. Unlike carbon-14 dating, which dates things that were once alive and then died, luminescence is inorganic. It dates minerals like quartz and feldspar. And what I'm actually dating is not the age of the mineral, but when it was last exposed to sunlight. So when it's exposed to sunlight, it's like a clock. It just gets reset to zero, so there's no signal at all. But then you take that quartz and feldspar and you put it in a cave in the dark, for thousands of years and during that time this light sensitive signal will build up because it's buried so it's building up over time and then if I take a sample and I take it back to my lab without exposing it to light I can actually get the luminescent signal to come out and I can measure it and the amount of light that comes off is proportional to how long it was buried for and because I'm dating the sediment it also gives me an age for anything that's in the sediment. So it's luminescence is an incredibly useful technique because it can just be applied to anywhere that you've got sediments because every sediment anywhere in the world will have either quartz or felspar in it. But what I love about dating is it's almost like going back in a time machine because you can pinpoint a moment in time. You know, I can I can work out that this event was occurring 100,000 years ago. So timing just changes everyone's perception on, on, on the evidence that you're looking at. And that's what's so amazing about it. If we could hop in a time machine and go back to the Pleistocene forest where Gigantopithecus lived in Southeast Asia, we'd experience a time of climate upheaval known as the Ice Age, when vast ice sheets spread across the Earth, freezing the planet and shrinking the forests. After some thousands of years, the ice sheets would thaw, the earth would warm again, and the forests grew and thrived. This happened over and over, and each time it cooled, the forests retreated and were replaced by grasslands. Unlike other large mammals that ate foods from the forests and the grasslands, Gigantopithecus was a forest specialist, and it survived several of these glacial periods until it didn't. For this project, the whole point was to do two things. We wanted to work out exactly when uh, Giganto went extinct in this extinction window. And rather than just dating known Giganto sites, we actually had a look at non-Giganto sites as well. So we actually looked at 22 cave sites and 11 of those were Giganto bearing. So we knew that Giganto was there at that time. We also looked at cave sites that 
we thought were of a similar age but didn't have Giganto. And that's really important because you want to have a, a broad spectrum in a, in a spatial area of sites of a similar age, some that have Giganto and some don't. Because to, to exactly work out when a species drops out the fossil record or becomes extinct, it's not going to happen in just one location. It's going to happen across a region. And, and we really wanted to get a good idea of exactly where, when it drops out and work out that extinction window. And then once we established that, we want to look at what the environment was like. So we used proxies like pollen. We had a look at stable isotopes on fauna. We had a look at micro sedimentology to really get an understanding of what the environment was doing and see if we could see any triggers or anything that might have changed during this extinction window period. And then we also had a look at behavior as well. So looking at what was a population look like? at 2.2 million years when it was flourishing and what did it look at look at 300,000 years when we know it was starting to to go extinct as the team gathers data and pulls all those threads of evidence together the gigantopithecus extinction story begins to emerge yeah so in the early case about 2.2 million we're talking hundreds of giganto teeth so there's always that thing that with cockroaches you find one there's probably like a hundred <laughs> represented by that one it's kind of the same i think with with gigantopithecus in the earlier caves the populations were flourishing and they were found in about four different provinces at that time in, in china so it was quite had quite a wide range um and there was a lot of giganto evidence around and then as we come up to more recent around 300,000, only a very, very small number of caves concentrated in the Guanxi area and only, you know, a couple of caves that represent that youngest giganto fauna and not very many teeth at all. So we can definitely see, even just by, I mean, if you just did the crude analysis of just looking at how many teeth, you can see how the population reduced. There's massive range reduction. So we had a number of provinces where we found Giganto, but towards the end, around 300,000, only one province, which was Guanxi. And that's where, that's where we focus much, most of our work because that's where we find the youngest teeth. Were there any human ancestors that lived in the same place at the same time? Yeah, so definitely a temporal overlap. There would have been humans in northern China, but definitely wouldn't have overlapped spatially because they lived in very different environments. What was the Giganto environment like? Do you know that? Yeah, so Giganto liked to live in forested environments, not necessarily living up in the trees, definitely on the ground, um, but the forested environment seemed to be its specialized niche. And we can see that other species such as orangutan, which obviously it's related to, tends to be a bit more um, flexible in the areas that can live, whereas Giganto we know were very focused on that, that one type of environment. Humans obviously would probably struggle in, in a forested environment and probably like to live in more open areas, which is easier for hunting and survival in that way. We're, we're open to the fact that maybe we might find Giganto and, and humans in the same cave, but not, not so far. Why are they in caves? Yeah, so they were definitely not living in caves. So this is not like an occupation site as you would have with hominins. The, these cast caves are just channeling everything that was on the landscape. So any bones, any teeth from fauna that had died on the landscape will then just get accumulated and washed into these caves. And although it's not in situ as in the animal didn't die actually in the cave it, it's representative of what's going on in the landscape at the time so usually when we date the sediments they're a little bit younger than the actual age of the fossil but we always look at both the fossil's always a little bit older because it's been on the landscape for a little bit before it then gets washed into the cave so your your leaky grant is looking at a couple of specific caves right yes yeah. can you tell us a little bit about that yeah definitely so Obviously, we came to the end of, of, of the current grant that we're doing and Ying Chi, unfortunately, we had to draw a line and said, this is the end now, we can't have any more additions into this paper. But Ying Chi was still finding caves and he found this one and it was a huge towering cast. And then around the other side of the hill, he found another cave, slightly lower. But when he walked in, he just couldn't believe there was just so much so many bones so many postcranial and he's like we have to excavate this this is going to be phenomenal as yet no giganto <laughs> we never usually get bones it's always teeth so we put in a grant uh for the leaky foundation to 
excavate these two caves. If there, if there was ever a better chance of finding postcranial giganto, this, this would be the cave. And remember, that's one of the big questions. What did it really look like? And we don't, we will never know until we find postcranial material. Until then, we're always estimating at what we think it looked like based on what orangutans look like and obviously scaling factors based on the teeth and, and the mandible. Originally, we were going to delay it slightly because of COVID. And then all of a sudden, Ying Chi heard from the locals that he works with down there that the government had earmarked that towering cast to be blown up because of a highway that was planned to be built right through the middle of it. But we put in a, a thing to say it actually has a lot of paleontological value. And they said, well, excavate it then. <laughs> <laughs> quickly before we want to blow it up so we had to contact the leaky foundation who were incredibly helpful and said yep yep you can have the funds right away get going now so we had to do an emergency excavation really quickly to try and just get all the fossils out that we could and we thought we had until the end of uh, end of last year the government had a bit of a reprieve because of the covid lockdown in beijing and the workers couldn't 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 do much so we got a little bit extra so Ying Chi's done another season uh fairly recently um to excavate the cave is phenomenal it's taking a long time to get through it because there are so many bones and we still have to excavate the the giganto cave on the other side as well and I think we're going to get some really really interesting research from them and just get just get as much done as possible and I mean the worst would be is we find another cave in that same towering cast and we don't have time to excavate it that would be really awful <laughs> so do you you and Yingqi feel like this is the last best chance? I mean, I think I think our understanding of the caves has, has really developed over the, you know, 10, 15 years that we've been looking, especially with this caving team. Now we've got a really good team and, and we're really starting to understand how to find these caves and, and what they look like. But why the preservation is so good in this cave and not in others, I don't know. I, I'm just hoping we get to a point where Ying Chi's happy that he feels like he's done everything he could and that, and that would be good. But yeah, crazy. How many other caves have been blown up that we haven't even had a chance to look at? And that's the thing about China. I mean, you drive around, it's just like, it's just billions of caves everywhere. Like, it's like you can't possibly look in all of them, you know? But Kira and her team want to look in as many caves as they can. Because today, we're facing a whole wave of human-caused extinctions, and understanding how extinctions happened in the past could help us understand what's most threatening to the animals we have now. What we're doing to environments and habitats is that what's really driving and, and, and which animals are more susceptible to it, which animals are, are really flexible and, and can adapt to certain environmental changes and which ones are just not flexible at all. I mean, Giganta we know was just not a very good adapter. And, and we think that was part part of the reason. But just understanding why certain animals are good at adapting and why other ones aren't, it just all has implications for understanding future extinctions. And the way we're going at the moment, facing the sixth extinction period, is a really daunting prospect. So anything we can understand about what's gone on in the past will help. Because the past is more than just the past. It's also a link to our future. I think just understanding the wonder of evolution and the fact that there are ancestors to, to our primates, to, to humans, that existed not that long ago in the geological time scale that we really don't understand. The way that science has advanced and our understanding of so many things around us and the world around us, there are so many things that are still mysterious and there are so many things that can still be surprising. And Giganto is the epitome of surprising. Such an amazing species and, and, and yet we just don't know much about it. And I think that's what really piques everyone's interest is understanding things that have happened in the past that we don't really know. And because we have all these scientific techniques, it's an amazing way to, like I said, almost create a time machine and go back in time and have a look at what the, the world was like at a time 300,000 years ago when humans were alive, humans were existing. And, and why did this ape go extinct? And we didn't. What did we do that helped us survive that Giganto couldn't do? Are there any lessons that we need to learn from that as well about how good humans are at adapting? And hopefully that will give us some hope for the future. We can adapt. We can be flexible with changing environments and changing world in the future. There is some hope.
Thanks to Dr. Kira Westaway for sharing her work. You can learn more about her and the Giganto Project on her website. The link is in your show notes. If you like this show and you like learning about evolution, I want to recommend Common Descent. Common Descent is a podcast about paleontology, evolution, and the history of life on Earth, hosted by two paleontologists with an unending enthusiasm for the wonders of the world. Each episode covers recent science news, followed by a deep dive into a main topic requested by the audience. Recent episodes have featured topics like armadillos, supercontinents, and photosynthesis, all examined through the lens of deep time and evolution. In addition to the main series, the Common Descent podcast also features side projects that explore the intersections of science and pop culture, where the hosts examine the science in movies or speculate on the hypothetical evolution of fictional monsters. I was a guest on the show once talking about Lewis and Mary Leakey. It was a lot of fun. I think you'd enjoy the show. You can listen to Common Descent on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Origin Stories is a project of the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to funding human origins research and sharing discoveries. You can support this show and the science we talk about by making a donation today. All donations to support Origin Stories will be matched by Jeannie Newman. So use the link in your show notes and donate today. This episode was produced and sound designed by Ray Pang, co-produced by me, Meredith Johnson. Our editor is Audrey Quinn. Our theme music is by Henry Nagel. Additional music by Blue Dot Sessions and Lee Rosevere. This episode was made possible by the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation, Jeannie Newman, the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund, and listeners like you. We'll be back next month on the last Tuesday of the month with an episode celebrating the 20th anniversary of a discovery of a tiny fossil that changed the world. Thanks for listening.